In this section we will present an overview of the ADO 2.11n draft and present an architecture for the implementation of an ADO 2.11n receiver. I'd like to highlight that first of all this is based on a draft. It's not the latest and greatest and the whole purpose of this presentation is to get a much better understanding of how a MIMO system will work in all its detail. Here is the structure of the packet for an 802.11n system. The first 16 microseconds we have the PLCP preamble which is compatible with the legacy preamble for 802.11a. That's followed by the legacy signal field, 4 microseconds. And this whole portion here is decodable by a legacy system. For a MIMO high throughput packet, the signal field is followed by the high throughput signal field, which is 8 microseconds wide. We'll talk a lot more about this. And for example, in the high throughput signal field, you specify what the modulation coding scheme is, the true length of the packet, and the, for example, number of transmit antennas and other parameters. For example, whether this is a 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz bandwidth system. Following the high throughput uh, signal field, you have the high throughput uh, short training field. Uh, this field is used for AGC refinement in order to do a better job of AGC and save, for example, a bit in the A to D and decoding the data field for a high throughput packet. That is followed by the high throughput long training sequences that are used in order to estimate the channel H matrix on a per carrier basis and of course that's covered in detail in a separate tutorial. Following the training for the high throughput long training fields is the data and the rate of the data is determined by the high throughput signal field as is its length. In a legacy type packet we would have the PLCP preamble, the signal field and the data associated with a legacy packet However, since in general the legacy devices can decode up to the signal field, there, there will be a specification for the length and rate in the legacy signal field and in those cases the legacy devices and the legacy field will be able to use the length and the rate in order to know the total length of the packet even though it is unable to decode this packet in the case of high throughput packets. Here we show the legacy packet. We have the legacy short training field, the legacy long training field which is 8 microseconds. These are the two long sequences which are duplicates of each other including the cyclic prefix. We have the legacy signal field which is 4 microseconds and then the legacy data. For a high throughput packet we have basic compatibility with the legacy 802.11a up to the end of the signal field. After that the packet is intended for 11n type devices that can decode a high throughput packet. However all devices will be able to decode up to and including the signal field. So we have the legacy short training field, 8 microseconds, the legacy long training field, 8 microseconds, 4 microseconds for the legacy single field. That's followed by the high throughput signal field, which is 8 microseconds. Again, the high throughput short training field, which is for AGC refinement. The training fields, long training fields used for estimating the H matrix and the high throughput data. Here are some of the symbol definitions which we run into and just quickly N sub SS is the number of spatial streams for example 2 R is the coding rate N sub BPSC is the number of coded bits per single carrier NSD is the number of data subcarriers NSP is the number of pilot carriers and of course as an OFDM we have the number of coded bits per symbol and the number of data bits per symbol NES is the number of FEC encoders and in our case it's always going to be equal to 1. We won't deal with cases where you have two, for example, convolutional encoders. That's usually the case when you have very high throughput and because of the limitations of hardware you might have to actually use two Viterbi decoders. Here's an example of modulation coding schemes for two spatial streams at 20 megahertz. 
So we have the MCS index, the modulation that is used, the rate, and the various parameters. Of interest to us is the fact that we can go from a high rate of 130 megabits per second all the way down to 13 megabits per second. Now notice that there's an option to use an 800 nanosecond guard interval just as an 802.11a or an express mode in which we use half the size of the guard interval and therefore we have less overhead and we can increase the throughput and as you can see we can go from 130 megabits per second to 144.44 megabits per second we also note that here we're dealing with open loop MIMO systems so that the modulation is applied to both spatial streams unlike beamforming where for example we can have 64 QIM on one spatial stream and QPSK on the other. It's very important to look at the format for the high throughput single field and the breakdown of its fields. First of all there are seven bits allocated for the MCS so we have 2 to the 7 or 128 possible indexes for the MCS and it is important to have a large number of possibilities for the MCS since we have to also accommodate beamforming. There is one bit allocated to indicate whether this is a 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz bandwidth packet. This is very important because the legacy devices cannot decode a 40 megahertz packet and also this allows for the receiver to adjust for a 40 megahertz bandwidth high throughput packet. The length, the HT length is 16 bits. Contrast this to 12 bits that are used in 802.11a. So the length could be 16 bits. The second uh, part of the high throughput signal field has the following fields. One is a field for smoothing. There's a reserved bit. There's a bit for aggregation, for space-time block coding, for specifying whether we're using advanced coding a bit for specifying whether we're going to use a short guard interval or the regular 800 nanosecond guard interval. Here we use two bits in order to specify the number of high throughput long training fields. So we have a maximum of four high throughput long training fields. This is very important. The CRC is eight bits long and this is a great improvement over the 802.11a signal field in which only a single parity bit was used. We have six bits that are used to flush out the Viterbi decoder, recalling that we have a constraint length equal to seven for the convolutional encoder. There are many other fields that are encountered that we will not discuss in great detail since our focus is actually to understand a complete implementation of a MIMO system so we won't go through all the various options. This is a very important uh, diagram because at the receiver we need some way to detect the high throughput signal field when we are receiving the packet. The legacy signal field uses BPSK modulation as does the high throughput signal field. However in the legacy signal field the constellation has shown but in the high throughput signal field the constellation is rotated as shown over here. So basically when you're decoding the packet by detecting the BPSK constellation as shown here with the rotation we can determine that we have in fact decoded the high throughput signal field and as we'll show then the receiver can start to decode the high throughput signal field, extract the MCS and adjust its configuration in order to decode the MIMO high throughput packet. This table shows the number of carriers that are used within 20 megahertz and 40 megahertz bandwidths. In the case of a legacy bandwidth, non-HT or non-high throughput, we use 48 carriers just as 802.11a with four pilots for a total number of carriers of 52 equal to 52. In the case of 802.11n, four more carriers were added in order to improve the throughput but at no cost to the bandwidth. The four pilots are used and we get a total number of uh, carriers equal to 56. In the case of 40 megahertz operation with a high throughput format, 108 carriers are used. Now notice that that is 
more than twice 52, which would be 104. And that's because when you aggregate the two 20 megahertz bandwidths, you don't need to use all the guard interval frequencies. And you can allocate some of those two data. And as shown here, also, you, you don't have to use all eight pilots, and you can use six pilots. The total number of carriers in the case of a 40 megahertz high throughput packet is 114. And the 2x3 MIMO OFDM system that we show over here, there's a few points we want to make. One is that in 802.11a, we always send, as we showed, the preamble using the legacy 802.11a preamble for packet detection, carry offset estimation and correction, and estimating the channel using the long training symbol for the legacy case. Recall that we still have to decode the single field. However, since we have multiple transmit chains, as we have indicated in a separate tutorial, we use cyclic delay diversity for transmit diversity. In the case of cyclic delay diversity, again applied to both the preamble and in the case of legacy to the data part, a nice property of the CDD scheme is that legacy 802.11a devices, for example, are not broken and can actually decode packets that are sent using transmit diversity with CDD because as we mentioned before CDD basically looks like a multipath delay and the channel estimator and equalization process can correct for it. Also in this diagram we're showing that we're using one convolutional encoder and not two which is the case for most of the rates that we're interested in 802.11a and it's of course of great advantage to use one convolution encoder versus having to use two Viterbi decoders, for example. So next we're going to go look at the architecture for the receiver and the draft 802.11n. So this is a very important diagram, and this is for a 2x2 uh, two two system, for example, where we have two receive chains. At the front end, we have the antenna with the RF front end, receive front end. We have the A to D. We have automatic gain control. We have a low-pass filter and decimation. So here we have basically the packet at 20 megahertz, for example. And let's just focus on a 20 megahertz system for now. Of course, we've simplified the diagram considerably. So at this point here, we basically have the two receive chains digitally encoded at a 20 megahertz sampling rate. First thing we receive is the legacy short training field, which is used for AGC packet detection and also course carrier frequency offset estimation and correction and course timing for example. I'm not going to go into detail in terms of the various architectures that can exploit the fact that you have two receive chains in order to improve packet detection and also for example carrier frequency offset estimation etc. However after we process the legacy short training field we also estimate the channel frequency response shown over here. So we estimate the channel based on the legacy long training field. Now unlike an 802.11a system, the results of the channel estimation are not passed directly to a equalizer but since we have multiple receive chains in this case we will do a maximal ratio combining in order to achieve receive diversity and this will greatly improve the performance even of the legacy 802.11a system. So for each receive chain we do a channel estimation that information is passed to the block here shown as MRC which will do a maximal ratio combining and then we come back to a single spatial stream and then we have the legacy decoding for example, the demapper, deinterleaver, depuncture, and the select selects this part first. We go through the Viterbi decoder and descrambler. We actually decode the legacy signal field, and this whole portion here is for 11A compatibility. Once the signal field has been decoded, we search for the high throughput signal field, and that's shown by this block here where we have the high throughput single field detector. And recall that. The high throughput single field detector is a BPSK modulated but rotated by 90 degrees. So this block here can detect the high throughput signal field 
And once the high-throughput single field has been decoded, we know what the MCS is, the modulation coding scheme. And we then adjust the receiver to demodulate a high-throughput MIMO packet based on the MCS. As an example, the MCS might indicate that we're using beamforming, etc. Once the high-throughput single field has been detected, we also indicate that we need to perform AGC refinement by processing the high throughput short training field for AGC and then adjust our AGC for the incoming high throughput long training fields and also the data. So after legacy signal decode, we detect the high throughput signal field, we decode its fields, we extract the MCS, we also start to process the high throughput short training field for the AGC refinement and after adjusting the AGC we start decoding the high throughput long training fields and that's where the H matrix estimation becomes active and as we start to estimate the H matrix we also compute for example in an MMSE equalizer the W matrix on a per carrier basis and store that such that when the data arrives and as shown here we have a 2 by 2 system so we have two receive chains for the data coming into the MIMO equalizer then the MIMO equalizer is able then to separate the two spatial streams pass them through a demapper and a deinterleaver again the demapper is adjusted based on the decoded MCS from the high throughput signal field so the demapper will then adjust for example to a 64 QAM or QPSK same with a D interleaver now the two spatial streams after the D interleaver are multiplexed together and pass through the D puncher and the select selects that stream goes through the Viterbi decoder and the D scrambler and we have the decoded bit stream for the high throughput case we also note that in some cases where we have a single spatial stream we are we will use MRC and then we can use this whole branch here for uh, MRC case where we're not doing high throughput where we only have one spatial stream where we're not using spatial multiplexing so in, the, in that case we're in diversity mode and the MRC is providing the diversity gain and we decode the packet through this branch here but of course all this is up to the architects who want to implement the 802.11n based on the latest standard and also this block diagram is mainly to show the events that start to kick in depending on where you are in decoding the packet and how the receiver must adjust itself based on decoding of the high throughput signal field and determining the MCS etc and also when and where to handle the H matrix estimation etc.